Welcome to Justin Hawkins Rides Again, the podcast. This has to be one of the best ones I've done. It's I'm just really excited uh, to introduce this episode to you because today I'm speaking with one of the greatest musicians in the entire world, Nate Wood. Um, if you want to know what it's like being in the uh, music industry your entire life, uh, then give this episode a shot. Um, Nate has a perspective on the music trade that I think you'll garner a lot of knowledge from. I'm not sure how many of you actually know who Nate is, but stick around and find out because he's fascinating. Um, I met him at the Taylor Hawkins tribute shows. He was in the Coattail Riders, uh, which was one of Taylor Hawkins' uh, side projects. And he, he was playing uh, rhythm guitar. But he's so accomplished. I mean, I, as soon as I walked into the rehearsal, I just bonded with him because it's kind of like, I don't know, he's one of those musical entities where you can throw anything in his direction, he'll decipher it and improve on it and throw it back at you. He's really an, an amazing person to collaborate with. Um, and I just think he's, he's astonishing. I really enjoyed talking to him. Please, to enjoy. Okay. Good day to you one and all. It is I, Justin Hawkins, and this is Justin Hawkins Rides Again. Um, today, on the Long Form Podcast, my guest is an elite musician. Um, how else can I describe you? Um, you are known as a jazz instrumentalist. Or I multi, so, yeah. no, jazz multi-instrumentalist. Right. So but, the internet, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Nate Wood, ladies and gentlemen. Regard. The exquisite. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Justin Hawkins rides again. You want to sing the last bit? Again. <laughs> wow, a lovely flourish on the end as well. <laughs> so, I didn't do the trail, but... Well, there's no need for it, actually. Yeah. Let's pop him there. Well, I can't see his face. Who is it? It's David Hasselhoff, but I mean, you oh, should recognize cool. him from the belt down, really. I mean, it's just... I, I, I all I see is his arm. I oh. mean, I guess I should recognize him just from like the wrinkle. Oh, yeah, of his you're arm on a different camera. Okay, me, there he is. Oh, great. Wow. Yeah, he's always, always right by my side. I did a thing a couple of years ago. Um, my brother bought me a David Hasselhoff t shirt <laughs> for, for my birthday. And then um, I just decided to wear it every day. And it started to annoy him. So I tried to make it into like a charity fundraising thing. I did, tried to do 100 days of Hoff where I was wearing the same T-shirt every day. And Great. the rule was, wasn't allowed to wash it. Um, everything I did had to do it in that T-shirt. I did a gig in it during festival season. And, uh, and I was, all the time I was trying to get David Hasselhoff's attention and I was sort of writing to him and trying to DM him on uh, Instagram and stuff. And I felt like he knew that it was happening but just chose to ignore me. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like, yeah, he probably gets that kind of attention sometimes and thinks it's doesn't take it as a compliment maybe or something. Well, do you think but that it should maybe be a compliment. Was a, did you think I was being facetious perhaps? Or? I don't know, maybe. But there's something about like, especially when you showed me that cutout, it feels empowering. Like I feel yeah. better about myself. So I would imagine if you wore that shirt for 100 days, you'd feel like yeah. really good about yourself. I mean, when I saw the hundredth day approaching, I was like, well, now what do I wear? Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> what do I do? So anyway, you yeah. and I met. It takes all the boxes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, you and I met uh, at the Taylor Hawkins tribute shows. Um, Indeed. Do you want to talk about that stuff or is it kind of s sensitive and sore? It. Yeah. Um, so you, among, uh, apart from everything else that you do, we'll get into all of that. But you play guitar in the Coattail Riders. Mm -hmm. So I was drafted in to sing and you were there. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I played rhythm guitar on two of the tours and sang like high falsetto parts, backgrounds. And the reason that I did that, I don't know if you know this, you might or not, I'm not sure, but is because... Taylor wanted me in the band because he thought he was going to play drums half the time uh -huh. and, and sing half the time. And so I would play drums half the time mm -hmm. and then play guitar the other half the time. Uh -huh. But we did some rehearsals um, uh, like before the first tour, and he didn't know what to do with his hands. Like when he got from behind the drum set, oh, really, he would just kind of stand there like this. <laughs> like he didn't know what to do. He, sa he sang great, of course, because he didn't have like – he had, didn't have to do all this. He could just like focus on singing. He's a great singer. But he just didn't know how to like 
he didn't know what to do. So he was just like, let's just shelve the drumming idea and you just play guitar and sing. I'm like, okay. But the reason he asked me to do it in the first place is because we grew up in the same town Mm -hmm. uh, in Southern California. And uh, he was kind of a legend. I never actually met him until I was in my like late teens probably. Mm -hmm. But I used to hear him practicing uh, like when I was doing soccer in fourth and fifth grade. Like his his garage was right over the hill from where the soccer field was. And so I'd hear him like <laughs> that many toms. Well, they were like the roto rush. toms, those little ones that queen enthusiasts have. I think there were some of those, and they were definitely concert toms, which are the ones with no bottom heads, uh-huh. which he started rocking towards the end of his life. Mm. He would have like two concert toms and then normal toms. Mm. And both of those are kind of considered jokes, but actually now they're kind of cool again because of yeah. Taylor. So, oh, cool. But yeah, so I grew up hearing him play, um, which was, I was like, oh, that's Taylor practicing to rush. Um, and then, you know, he was just kind of legendary around town. Like, don't lend any of your stuff to Taylor because he'll break it. <laughs> like, okay. oh, man, I got this brand new DW pedal and I lent it to Taylor and he broke it in one gig. Like, yeah. that was like the word around, you know, town about Taylor. And he used to work at this music store uh, out in Mission Viejo. And he had the same personality, but he worked at a music store. Taylor was just like always that way. He was always just like larger than life, Mm -hmm. you know? So uh, it was kind of like ill-fitting for a music store. So it's good that he (laughs) – obviously he was destined to do do great things. Um, So when he got out of – you know, when he got his first big gig, it was like, oh, yeah, okay. That makes a lot of sense. So – but anyway. Yeah, it was super sad. (laughs) But But do you know what people were saying to me about you? When I was no. walking around Wembley, they, they were saying <laughs> what? there was people. I mean, not more than one person took me to one side and pulled me by the shirt and, and did this in your direction. And said, "You realise that this is the best musician in the entire fucking stadium." Oh man, that's <laughs> yeah. so. Dumb, and like, uh, and, that's and, awesome. and then somebody else said the best drummer <laughs> as well. And then when oh, I was wow. looking at you, I was kind of like, I, "I know this guy from somewhere. Who, where do I know him from?" And then I realized that because I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, Lewis Cole, yeah, what I actually, re- where I actually recognized you from was from those live sessions. The um, awesome. Fuck it up. And um, there's one where you play drums, isn't there? Which is that thinking? You do on thinking, that one. yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then I thought, then it clicked. I was like, oh, it's that guy. And then I explored you further, if you'll permit me using that euphemistic expression. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, discovered that you do a lot of music where you're playing the drums, the bass or the guitar, and the synthesizer, and singing at the same time. Yeah, indeed. So, wh- why why do you days. do all those things at the same time? <laughs> it's a is good it, question. If I could posit a theory. Yeah, please do. Is it because you don't trust anybody else to do it as well as you? Are you like mm. one of those guys? <laughs> no, it's actually the total opposite. So I did... I made three records on my own, uh, one in 2003, one in 2007, and one in 2014. And I played all the instruments. And really, it's just because I don't want to bother anybody. I don't want to, like, go through the hassle of calling people up and be like, you know. So I'd rather just do it myself. Mm. Um, and then the – and I started – I would gig with that stuff, but I would kind of do it local. And it was mm. always just like, yeah, you know, some some nights were good. People would show up and all that stuff. And then some nights were not good and people wouldn't show up. And it's like – I always want to pay people what they're worth Mm. and all that stuff. And it's like, man, this is just like too kind of hard to do it this way. But then also, also, um, I had the ability to play drums and bass at the same time for – I've been able to do it now for like 20 years or something. Mm -hmm. Like because I used to do it um, playing in back singer-songwriters and stuff like that. I would play drums and bass and sing backgrounds. (laughs) It's really exhilarating to watch because I think that, you know – one of the problems I have when I see a band is I'm always looking for the rhythm section to see how they interact, you know. And then, so when I'm watching you, it's like, oh fuck! Obviously, it's the same person, so it's gonna be it's gonna be tight, you yeah, know, to say the totally. least. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's very very tight. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, so I was doing that for a long time, and then there were a few people who started actually doing that as a lead thing that I s- saw. My good friend Josh Dion, who has this band called Paris Monster. Have you heard mm, of them? I haven't, though. Dude, mm. check them out. Paris Josh Monster. Josh is like, okay. he's a monster. He sings like, 
I'm, I can't even really say who he sings like. He really sings like his own guy. But he's yeah. like big, big singer, really strong singer, plays keyboard, bass like Stevie Wonder, plays drums like a mixture of Bonham and like Elvin wow. Jones or something. Wow. And the music is like really badass. It's, it's a duo with this guy who plays bass, Jeff Crayley. And modular synth, and so the modular synth is just doing sample and hold the whole time, mm-hmm. and then they're just freaking out. When you say and modular synth, do you mean one of those ones where you've got all the patch bay and, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, like, uh, like that. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> wow! I just happen to have one of those here. Hold it up again. I want to see. What, I want to see. What, you know that thing when uh, someone walks into a studio and the first thing they say to the engineer is, "Do you know what all those knobs do?" Those yeah, knobs. exactly. So this is the uh, this is the ARP twenty six hundred, which is um, that's the the who like that's like oh, okay, that's yeah. like his thing. Yeah. So he would plug into the input and do all the filter stuff with that. So is the ARP an, an, an abbreviation of arpeggio thing? Generator? No, it's it's the guy's name, oh. uh, like Alan R. Per- Perlman or something like that. Okay. But uh, but that's a, that's a that's a modular. Yeah. Anyway, so so Josh was doing that, and Josh played drums in my band. Um, and he lived two blocks from me, but he was also the only other person that I'd ever seen do this, which is mm. like really weird. Yeah. Uh, and then there's another guy named DeAntony Parks, um, uh, who is has a has a solo project called TechnoSelf. And he plays drums like an eight bit computer, and then mm-hmm. plays like samples with his right hand. And it there's no it doesn't sound human at all. Like his drumming is like there's no way that's a human playing that. Really? Um, it's really cool. Check that wow. stuff out too. So I saw them doing that, and I was like, "Oh man, I I can kind of already almost do this. I should just go all the way with it." So yeah. And then how long then did I, it take for you to to hone, you know, bringing in this the synthesizer for that other harmonic information in the top top areas? About a year or so, because I was trying to do music like my solo records, which is like overly complex harmonically, mm. and it was like, "Oh, this isn't working." And then as soon as I kind of made simpler choices and made it more like electro- electronic music then it was like oh this is cool yeah so it was about a year and then it was like oh the music has to change obviously and then uh, i could start doing it so but it was like it was really hard at first the first videos of course it was like i would practice something for like you know two weeks or something and then record a day of it and get a take you know yeah. so it took a long time to kind of get it going but now it's at the point where it's like i write a song and i can like i play it 10 times and i have it you know wow so it's fast now. That's really cool. Because when I spoke Same. to you the other day, you were saying that you had a gig that night and you were desperately trying to finish off some music for the gig <laughs> well, yes. that night, which is really ballsy. I would never do something like that. You know? Yeah, like, I kind of live for that. Um, I, yeah. I, I live to like not really be totally sure what's going to happen. Um, and uh, <sighs> I totally forgot the words to the song. Like I just... Total, but it doesn't matter. Nobody really listens to wor- song words. Or maybe, <laughs> no. maybe they do. But then it's like, yeah, there's part of me when there's like, I- I'm not really sure about how this middle section is going to go. Then the whole rest of the concert is so much better because yeah. I'm just kind of scared for that. Do you know what? I think so. you and I, apart from the obvious golf in talent, might be quite similar in that respect. When I was like 18, I was doing fully improvised stuff you know really I was, yeah i was i just had a awesome just a guitar and a drum machine and i had no set list no idea what i was going to do and i'd just be making up songs and i'd open for local bands and stuff and oh man people thought i was preposterous and i suppose that, i would love to hear that <laughs> yeah, so good at that. i mean that makes a lot nothing, of sense nothing recorded but i mean it's kind of like it was just i was just jamming with myself and pissing about and making up songs Dude. you know i'm gonna start a petition to have you do that again well, I'm not doing it unless you come out with me. <laughs> okay, I'm down. We've, we've got to work on some stuff anyway, I'm sure we'll... Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd love to. I'm going to do some more introductory stuff for you. Um, so okay. apparently you have toured and performed with artists such as George Harrison. Okay, um, that shouldn't be on there, but I, I can explain it. Go on, it's explain. a no, yes. Okay, yeah. so my dad, uh, whose music I introduced you to, yeah. right? Steve okay. Mars, right? Steve, yeah, Steve, and his n- real name is Steve Wood. The mm-hmm. the you'll like the story. Um, there was another artist named Steve Wood at the time uh, who was maybe even on the same label. Okay, <laughs> Steve Woods. And so they were like, "Can you come up with a different name?" You know, and he was like, "Steve Mars." And they're like, "I hate it." He's like, "That's my name." <laughs> so, but it's two R's, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just full ridiculousness. It's brilliant. Um, yeah, it's great. It's a great name. 
But I forgot what I was. Oh yeah, so my dad did a bunch of IMAX movies. He did scores for those, okay. and a lot of times artists would lend their entire catalog slash write new music sometimes or whatever. And so my dad got multi tracks from like you know the Police's whole catalog, Sting's whole catalog, like George Harrison's catalog, like Paul McCartney stuff, like full multi tracks that he could just do whatever he wanted with. Mm. Um, and so on a few of those movies, I was probably in my teens, like when I would play drums on his movies. Um, and so George Harrison was one of them and Sting was another one, but Sting actually contributed a, a new song to that soundtrack. So, and I played drums on it. So it kind of counts. Cool. That definitely counts. Yeah. Definitely counts. Um, I'm going to go through the list. Shaka Khan. Mm -hmm. So what were you touring with her or were you in her band yeah or? it was just a couple gigs but it was subbing for Vinnie Colyuda again it was in my teens I was like 17 or 18 oh, it was her uh, jazz project at the time mm -hmm. so it was kind of like you know jazzy fusiony whatever funky stuff so yeah I did it in my late teens I guess so she liked it though <laughs> that's the bottom line yeah, you know, Shaka Khan like Shaka Khan likes it. Then you're in business. Um, yeah, and then it says here, there's Sting is the next one. We've already covered Sting, Wayne uh -huh. Krantz. Yeah, do you know who that is? I don't actually. Did I say it okay. right? You did. You said it perfectly. You actually announced him the way that I heard Donald Fagan announce him when okay. I first <laughs> saw them. Which so he was the guitar player in um, Steely Dan in the late '90s. Oh wow! Okay. So this, and, is, this uh, goes back to your Yacht Rock heritage as well. It does. Yeah. yeah, and actually Wayne kind of, he changed my whole trajectory in terms of how my life would go. That mm -hmm. concert did. Mm. Um, so Donald announced his name, Wayne Krantz. Krantz. And he just said, kept saying Krantz over and over again, just really emphasizing what was he trying to? Was he trying to like um, simulate the effect of a, of a delay or something like that? I think so, or just like... I don't know. He just really got stuck into how that name sounds, you know, <laughs> which is, you know, it's a good last yeah, name. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But um, he, Wayne, at that time, all he was doing was playing through a deluxe turned on 10 and he had no pedals. And so it was like anti Steely Dan. Like it wasn't mm -hmm. like, oh, I played the solo for my old school. It's like Wayne would play this thing where you're just like, I didn't know a guitar could do that. Like mm. he just do this thing that you should check him out too because he's one of the best guitar players who's ever lived. And he's wow. kind of, Responsible for how new music sounds. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> like, yeah, like Lewis and me and like yeah. Mark Juliana and like all these guys like kind of come from his school of rhythm. Wow. He's like, he's a guitar player, but he's kind of one of the most influential drummers like on, on the world of drummers that I know about. Okay. Because of the way he plays guitar is so drumistic. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I kind of moved to New York to play with him, to be honest. Like, because oh, wow. I'm such a huge fan of his and he's... Guitar playing really informed my guitar playing, the way I play bass, the way I play drums and all this stuff was kind of from him. So I played bass or drums with him, sometimes both on the same show for about, you know, eight years or something. And there's a record where uh, I do half and half. So. Wow. There it's you have it. fucking awesome. <laughs> check him out, though. You, yeah, you dig him. Yeah, I'm going to check everybody out that you've said so far. What was the first one? Did Paris Monster, did you say? Paris Monster, yeah. That's a great name, isn't Man, it? Man, you'll love Paris Monster. Okay, awesome. Um, and then The Calling. Yes. What's The Calling? I, I always think of The Call. Yeah. Which was, uh, wasn't The Call okay. the band that did like the song that was covered by, oh, it, here comes some trivia. They did a song called I Still Believe, which was covered by Timmy Capello, and that was him performing that song at the opening scene of Lost Boys when it, when it comes into Santa Cruz. And, the, oh, and then wow. he's all oiled up playing the saxophone. Okay. Not that band, the right? Call, no, and The Call, I thought they also did like some Danzig covers and stuff like that. Like they were kind of like yeah, they were on indie. the border of like, of like Danzig and then like pop or like, you right. know, pop rock. That's, I mean, this is my nine-year-old brain talking right now, but <laughs> that's, that's how I remember them. Yeah. But the Calling is not that. Okay. Um, it's a band from the early aughts, and uh, they had a song called Wherever You Will Go. Uh, if I could, then I would. I'll go wherever you will go. I'm singing it like oh, a country yeah, twang. Yeah. Country you, twang, I apologize. That, <laughs> were you doing chin singing then? <laughs> I mean, yeah, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, like uh, Ozarks meets um, chin singing <laughs> yeah <laughs> which is definitely so I, yeah that's the sweet spot between ozarks and chin 
Totally. That's what I was going for. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so I played drums on most of the, some of their first record and did that tour right so out of college. So when you do gigs like that, is it kind of like, um, is that like session playing? And somebody says, I need a drummer, and then somebody goes, well, I know the best drummer in the world. Here he is, kind of thing. <laughs> um, no, that was, that was actually kind of like, sort of like it was a band-ish. Like we were on ah. the cover, back cover, yeah. on all the posters, okay. on all the tours, you know, so... Yeah. We were on the record. So it was kind of more of a band type thing. Uh, you know, and I was in that, I was played with them for like two and a half years, a year of just playing locally around LA. And then the record came out and it was just, you know, it was like the tail end of, I think it was right before your first record, right? Wasn't okay. your first record like 03? It was, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this was like 01 to 03. Okay. And then they kind of fell off a little bit after 03. So. Yeah. Wow. But yeah, we caught the tail end of, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but we caught the tail end of the music industry. It was really something. You mean before it all changed? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. When did you think, when do you think the music industry changed? Would you say it was around about six, seven, oh six, oh seven? I mean, it changed in oh one for sure, because Mm. like that was when Napster came out. Oh yeah. And they were already saying like, so that record went at the time went gold but they were like, it should be quadruple platinum. Like, because the song was huge. Mm. Uh, it went, it did really well over the rest of the world, but they were like, yeah, it should have sold a lot better. Oh, Napster. Mm. You know, and like so many dinners, like they were on RCA and so many dinners with A&R guys who were like, you know, the problem is that we can't like fund like the, the up and coming talents because we don't have the money coming in because of mm. Napster and all that stuff. So it was like, oh yeah, it's already really changing. Yeah. Um, but there were so many douchebags at those dinners that I was like, you know what? Good riddance. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, oh God, yeah. I, I think we didn't sign our record contract until 03. Okay. And the reason being that there were people aware of us in the years preceding that. But as you say, like it changed so much because of Napster that there was no inclination to take a chance on anything that didn't exactly fit into what they know they can market and there's no risk involved so but i guess was your project that i mean that doesn't sound like it fits into any category that i know of you know what i mean like mm. you guys are you guys are your own category still like i think you know but i mean that in a good way <laughs> yeah it's like a good queen's success. their own category yeah you know like a lot of the great bands are their own category the police mm. was their own category like mm. led zeppelin's their own category it's like so I don't really – I'm surprised that that was the case, although the songs are so strong that clearly maybe that's what it was. It was just the songs were so good. I think there was momentum as well because we did, we did a lot of live stuff that was going well, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one more band okay. on this particular list that you're involved with, Snarky okay. Puppy. Okay. What's that? Yes. So I haven't played with them per se, but I – basically have um i've played with all the members it's so they're a large form jazz ensemble (laughs) Mm. um and man so we played wembley arena like last year (laughs) wow um it's a jazz band yeah 12 piece jazz band they played wembley arena and there was like eight thousand people there what does that it was actually well it tells me a few things first of all that was the month after we did Wembley Stadium, right? Which was just, I mean, so you were just like, "This is rubbish." I, I want to be this old hat. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but but no, what what it tells me is it, it tells me a lot. It's it's uh, it gives me a lot of faith in humanity because mm. their band is, uh, they've been doing it for a long time. They have a gazillion records. Michael League, who is the very type A but incredibly sweet bass player, who's the leader of that band has just pushed and pushed and pushed and made that band into what it is. But also, uh, it's totally collective where everybody in the band writes music. So the new song, the new record has like 18 songs on it or something because mm-hmm. they wanted songs from everybody on the record. Yeah. And um, when they play live, they play, you know, he plays everybody's songs and they announce everybody and all that stuff. Um, so, and when they play live, it sounds like a record every time. Like it's like, they're such good musicians and it's so slick and the groove is so good. It's more of kind of like, like a, like a churchy jazz, you know, like it comes more from like Texas kind of church feel, like okay. just funky. Yeah. And then with like jazz harmony and like improvisation and all that stuff in there. Yeah. But it's heady music. It's not like, you know, really simple melodies or any of that stuff. It's 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 complicated music. But man, the audiences like love it everywhere. 
Yeah. Even in like I did a, a long tour in America with them, and I'm about to do another one opening for them. Oh, cool. And it's like even in America, it's like they, you know, the times when the audience gets the most excited is when they're really improvising. When they're going to an, into a zone where they're, they're not sure how they're going to get out of it, mm. that's when the audience is like, you know, like yeah. on the edge of their seat. Which but is I think, really you know, that's, that's, for me, that's kind of like what's great about rock and roll as well, isn't it? I mean, it's sort of people exactly. operating on the very edge of their ability. You don't know yep. if it's going to teeter over or fall apart. And that's what you want. That's what you want to see. It's like, but I suppose when the level of musicianship is up there, you've got to go down some serious musical meanderings to, <laughs> to find to find that sort of difficulty. It must get really intense. I've got to go and see this. It does. It, it it doesn't. It's still super organized because it's like if you have eighteen people on stage. I mean, or however many, twelve, thirteen. I I, can't, I lose count. They are always contracting and expanding, but. Mm. So it has to be semi-organized in terms of like, you know, it's your solo tonight, but your solo could be anything. And if it's going great, you might just keep playing much longer than you thought you did. And so it it is really, um, you know, it is pretty exciting. But the reason that I that gave, gave me a lot of faith in humanity, especially the America part, was because Americans can tend to be – want to go to a show expecting something. Yeah. You know? And you can't really go to a show expecting an experience like that. That's just mm. like – the air, you know, like something happens in the air and that's like you can't expect for that to happen or, you know. So it's just cool to see that like, oh, yeah, people really want to see cool stuff happen, you know. Yeah. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah, check them out too. And they're yeah. all – oh, Lewis and Genevieve have uh, have done some songs with them like on one of their okay. records. Mm -hmm. So it all ties together. It's all like the same. Yeah. Group, so what you know? is this scene that you're part of then? How does this <laughs> emerge and – how do I get to be part of it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you are part of it, or I don't know. Um, I'm, I don't know. Yeah, but uh, I'm not sure how it started really, but I was in a band called, ne I am in a band called Kneebody, and we were playing around L.A. starting in 03, and around 05, this lanky, tall, like awkward teen started coming to all my gigs mm -hmm. and started saying hilarious stuff to me after every gig. It was Lewis. Mm. And he came to every gig I did with that band and then every – like even I do gigs at restaurants with like jazz bands and yeah. he would just come and like be there mm -hmm. and be like, so on this song, when you play the snare drum, like, you know, just – I'm trying to imitate my Lewis voice. Um, <laughs> so – but then on one of the occasions, he handed me a CD and I was like, man, I really like this kid. And I never would listen to those CDs because I'm just mm. in my own like floaty world all the time. But I put his CD on and it was like full Lewis genius. Like yeah. not like, oh, he really came into his own. No, it was like 19-year-old genius, just yeah. fully, full on. That's and how like, I would describe him, full genius. Full genius and like fully realized as a 19-year-old because like yeah. he had some songs from his first record, but then he also had some like some fake Mexican food commercials <laughs> and just like a lot of weird stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I was like, oh, man, this guy's amazing. So um, anyway, I was going to say, like, I left L.A., but I kind of feel like Lewis and his friends kind of all encouraged each other to do whatever they want to do yeah. uh, and make cool stuff happen. And it's just kind of like... Well, it feels like a scene of some sort. It is a scene. And it's, yeah. and it's definitely like a counterculture of, of some sort. But it's not yeah. based on that sort of nihilistic... Ah! you know punk and loud stuff it's actually really accomplished and a lot of it's really beautiful as well yeah and, and it you seems know, like the I'm, overriding I'm, messages in there are kind of like I don't know I listened to um, was it Quality Over Opinion is that the last mm -hmm. that the last record um, mm -hmm. I just thought it was fucking amazing I just loved yeah. it you, you yeah, played a on a couple of those songs didn't you or, I did yeah I played bass on something yeah, he's a he's a total genius, but um, uh, I think it is counterculture, and I just realized what the counterculture is. So when I lived in L.A., the culture was you play music, and somebody is watching who's going to give you a job that's better than the, the you're doing right now. So even, even if you're playing jazz or you're playing, like, your own music, there might be somebody out there who's going to, like, put you in their movie or, like, hire you for a tour of kind of lamer music than what you're a part of. Right. So people had to be kind of, or people were self-conscious of that all the time. Mm. And that's part of why I moved, because I was just like, man, I don't want this. This isn't really how you play music, you know? Mm. And my band, Kneebody, was not that. It was like, 
we were weird. You know, people came to see something weird. I mean, I thought it was weird. I mean, it was weird in that just like it felt like it was useless can, in in that can, kind of <laughs> scene. You know, I can, and then but knowingly and le- what leaning into the uselessness. Not even that. Just being like, we're doing what we, we're doing. We don't care. Like this is just this is exactly the music <laughs> we want to make. Like who cares about anything else? Yeah. But I think that's what the counterculture is. The counterculture is Lewis and all those guys are doing music that they just want to do. Who cares about the music industry? Who cares about looking like sexy in a classical way? Or who cares about any of that stuff? The counterculture is like, screw the commercial part of it. This is just I'm doing what I'm doing, you know, yeah. kind of thing. But in in that process, it becomes desirable and commercial and sexy at the same time as punk music did, you yeah. know? So it's it's kind of worked out, but it's you know it it's still counterculture, and it's definitely not um, it's exhilarating. Any it's of that just spark. amazing to think that there's that level of musicianship in a counter in a counterculture. But you, you mm-hmm. sort of feel like um, guys like yourself, Lewis Cole. At some point, somebody's going to come to you with a checkbook and say, "Look, we've got this uh, rising uh, pop vocalist who needs." In your instance, uh, perhaps a drummer, bass, bassist, guitarist, or saxophonist, <laughs> you know, or backing vocalist. Um, here's a whole lot of money to not do those weird little projects and, <laughs> and come and do this. And what what happens in that instance? Which is coming, by the way. Well, I don't think it's coming because there's just not really any money in the music industry, um, and that's just makes me really happy oh but there is there yeah. because i think the long tail yeah. thing i always talk about that stupid long tail like the, the way the internet was supposed to sort of stop it from being a few dominant bands and then like a a few hundred thousand bands that don't really make any money now it's like one or two really dominant artists and then one billion bands that make <laughs> nothing <laughs> You know? Exactly, and it, they right. thought it would do the opposite because there'd be more access to sort of niche music, and people would listen to what they wanted to listen to. But they don't. They listen to the stuff that's marketed, and they ignore everything else. You know, yes, yeah. it's, it's it's just worse than it was before. And the only thing we've got is live. That's all we've got. So right. I think at some point it is coming. I think that those people who are the dominant forces are going to need musicians like you that they can rely on, and they're going to come with the checkbook. I know they are. <laughs> and what will you do? Well, thanks. Well, you know, like a, a, a semi-good friend of mine, Dave Cook, is actually Taylor Swift's musical director and has mm-hmm. been for a long time. And mm-hmm. he's a badass jazz piano player. Mm-hmm. So that's like those guys are already doing that. Like, you know, those guys are already kind of like, yeah, you that's the guy you call because he's super good. He knows all the other good people. He's going to put on the best show. You mm-hmm. know, it's not some guy who talked himself into the job, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, good for him. But... I I don't know. I mean, I would rather. So th- that's the thing. I did the calling thing. It was fun. Like mm. we did some man. We did some massive shows when I was in my twenties. Like played at Hyde Park for hundred thousand wow. people. Like cool. had armed armed like bodyguards with machine guns in Brazil and like <laughs> you know like just really kind of peak. And and we went on t- we we went on TRL actually like. Which, when it was still around, yeah. it's still the loudest sound I've ever heard is the, the, the sound of those screaming girls at that particular age mm-hmm. group, like 13 Well, I to noticed, 17. actually, when we walked on stage um, at Taylor Hawkins, you and I held hands and walked yeah. out. Yeah, <laughs> just beautiful, I love that. <laughs> it, was a, it was one of my favorite moments of the whole thing. Me too. And um, because you open-heartedly ransacked my uh, wardrobe and chose a, a, a fitting cat suit, <laughs> <laughs> which I really respected. And you, you kept the trademark hat, which I was uh-huh. trying to talk you out of, but you were the right, <laughs> you did the right thing. Um, and then as we walked out there, I was expecting some sort of fanfare for myself, you know, with this visage and kind of like just being the England guy. But no, it was all about you in that cat suit. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. I mean, it, uh, I don't know. I just love that. I love walking out on stage holding somebody's hand that I've only just met. It was just, it was a great moment for me. Yeah, me I feel too. Like we bonded. Was, oh, I, I totally felt like that too. I, I wanted to ask you about that too because I have a lot of questions for you. Um, oh, cool. So, <laughs> so that's a good one. First of all, what was the, do you do that often or is that just something that came over you as like a way to get like, 
I don't know, like connected and or what well, holding your hand or yeah. What was the uh, yeah. I'm just wanting to know where that instinct came from. I feel like I know where that instinct came from, and it's the same, like, you know, reason why it, it doesn't. It makes a lot of sense that you've done improv shows where you play with the drum machine and guitar, but yeah, I think um, just in that moment, it seemed apt because when we when you and I run stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a, perhaps there's a conversation about harmony and I think like a guitar harmony or something like that. And I think we're both the kind of players that don't really need to look at the fretboard to find that, you know? And so I kind of like felt like, ah, oh, this guy is basically m my brother today. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're, <laughs> we're, we're going to go out there and do something spectacular and emotional in in tribute to somebody who meant a lot to both of us mm -hmm. why wouldn't we walk out there holding hands you know it just it just didn't it would have been a shame if we hadn't done that i think you know? yeah it would have been sort of i don't know we'd, I, I wanted to go out there connected to you and that was i don't know I'm glad That's you. Really uh, cool. I'm glad you felt the same way. <laughs> I did. I mean, I never would have had that instinct, but when you did it, I was like, "Oh yeah, of course," you know. But but then I think like, "Wait, why? Oh yeah, of course." But but yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> what was your so theory sense. about it then? What, what what? Just that. Just like, wait, where did that instinct come from? It makes sense. Who cares? That was awesome. That was yeah. the theory. But yeah. then just also, yeah, like I felt connected to you right away too. Just like, oh yeah, this, you know, just felt. Like we were up, whatever, it felt um, same thing, you know, yeah. connected. Yeah. But it, I mean, that whole thing was so cool. Like that whole week I saw, I watched most of the one of you talking to Rufus about it. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was like on the on the M train on the way to the city watching, you know, the Hudson River and like, mm -hmm. you know, watching you guys talk about it. It was really cool. But just remembering that whole thing, like people walking in and like it felt kind of like this this huge like church service celebration thing yeah. and like I, I cried like seven times that day yeah and then just that big like poster like that big picture of the hawk you know that, that mm -hmm. big banner of the hawk like yeah, that we could the see the, the whole thing. time we were playing yeah. man it was just like because yeah thing was that, like a that was such a brilliant touch because i think that when you're on the stage you know, you probably feel the same way that it, there's a thing about being in the moment and it's kind of like one of the beautiful things about live music is that you can't focus on anything else that's happening around you. And sometimes you can forget why you're doing it. And then just that yeah. emblematic kind of banner of a hawk at the back of the stadium is like, fuck, you never, you never allowed yourself to forget why you're there and who it's for, you know. <laughs> that's that's why it felt kind of like churchy in a way, you know, yeah. like to me, like it, it had that feeling like and everybody played like that, too. Everybody played, especially the, the London gig. Everybody played like yeah. they were playing outside of themselves. Yeah. You know, like everybody yeah. was playing for this like higher power, which was the hawk. Mm -hmm. And it was just, man, that was the coolest thing I've ever been a part of for sure for that. I so think cool. I'm going to have to agree with that. I think same here. Yeah. yeah. Unbeatable. <laughs> Everybody just played their asses off too. It was so cool. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. So that yeah. Was awesome. Yeah. But also, also the uh, so along those lines, my my good friend Billy Moeller, who I think he said he's met you before and he loved you, and he he was also in the calling. He's a jazz bass player, of course. Who was in the calling with me? <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he was at the the forum show. Mm -hmm. And he got the thing on film where you introduced my nipples to the whole. Oh, <laughs> I can't remember what I said now. I said, uh, what you, are you well, about? I've seen it before. I I watched it because he sent it to me, and you were just like, you said like, here's, you know, he said, he's never seen his nipples before today, <laughs> and now like twenty thousand people are seeing them at the same time he is or whatever. Oh yeah, and, then and he that's Nate's nipples. <laughs> yeah, no, I and think that's I, where, did I say the nipples of Nate? I think you did. Yeah. yeah. And then you said Emerald Sorcerer too, which is like, where did you come up with that brilliant name? Like, so that's the same thing. That's part of where the question of like the holding hands, the Emerald Sorcerer thing, like all that was just perfect. But like, you know, 
Yeah, well, I guess you can't really explain where it came from, but it was just great. I loved it. Yeah, I mean, I just feel like because I, you know, when you wear when you wear my green cat suit, it has this sort of mm -hmm. flared sleeve, and it just made you look a bit wizardy, and it's green. So you were the emerald sorcerer, and shall from this day forth always be the emerald sorcerer. That's great. <laughs> I love it. I want to. Yeah. yeah. Well, if we ever do something together, then it's clear what my wardrobe is, and it's nice to just have that yeah. predetermined. Well, because we're exactly the same know? size and build, so it's easy peasy, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Great. So. <laughs> well, How do you have new cat suits since the last time I've seen you? Uh, and you, how many do you have? I've. Um, I've, I don't know how many I've got in total, but um, since I last saw you, Angela has made me one more for the next lot of touring. And we wanted to do something that's sort of in tribute to the black and white stripe thing that I always used to do. And I've done it. I've done a couple of iterations of that kind of theme. But she's done one that's kind of like futuristic Thierry Mugler style with weird kind of fluid fluidity in the stripes. And it's awesome. I really can't mm. wait to wear it. So you'll see that when we when we get yes. together in New York, awesome. which will be fun. And you'll be, uh, I'll have some security on my uh, clothing rack to make sure that you don't walk <laughs> off with it. <laughs> you know. Awesome. I think yeah, my I next wait. tattoo is going to be a fucking great big hawk. Right here. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm right in the middle of my chest. That's wow. where it should go. Yeah, that's a good idea. Mm. Man. <laughs> good, you said good idea and made it sound like a terrible idea at the same time. <laughs> no, no, I, no. I'm just imagining it. So it was there were two processes going on at once, which is hopefully how my music my music doesn't sound like that. But, um, but yeah, it's. I think that would look really good. I have some more traditional questions that sort of go along the lines of what I normally ask people about. Okay. So, because we always call this the jaws of victory, pitfalls of the music industry, and so on. What, in your view, are the biggest pitfalls of the music industry? So uh, I don't know because I grew up in the music industry uh, and I grew up during the heyday of the music industry, you know, mm. like uh, so my dad, you know, was playing with Kenny Loggins in the 80s. When you said to yeah. me, you, well, last week you said to me that you come from <laughs> Yacht Rock Royal Royalty. I was, I was you not, weren't fucking not kidding, kidding. Were you? <laughs> no. And like you know, my my parents are on first name basis with Michael McDonald and Jackson Brown and all those guys. You know, like for so long ago. Wow. Um, so that's just that's just my ilk. You know, it's like mm. my genetic thing. Mm. Um, but anyway, so I grew up like my dad was doing that. You know, and do, do you mind uh, if I interrupt you just for one second? Go. When so if you grow up around. Yacht Rock, mm -hmm. which in my view is a genre that's impossible to dislike. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have Agreed. a period where you um, wanted to rebel and do, um, do music that disappointed your father <laughs> and move away from that as kind of That's a good question. Point? You know, I kind of did because I did jazz, which is like very not Yacht Rock. Mm. But my music certainly has a lot of tinges of Yacht Rock and it's it so... Does unironic that it might go unnoticed <laughs> yeah which is the thing it's like true yacht rock has no irony but new oh. yacht rock is is ironic you know well i don't know if yacht rock <laughs> the true yacht rock would ever refer to itself as yacht rock so that, no but that's that's what i'm saying it's yeah. like it wasn't ironic you know now it's like it's been birthed this title of yacht rock yeah. and so it's so it's if you declare ironic. yourself to be a yacht rocker then you're almost sort of self-deprecating in that in that way and do you know what I mean? Yeah, maybe. I mean, for me, it's like, it's more just like, it, it, it was such a strong part of my musical language that it's, yeah, that's definitely part of my influence. But, um, you know, I'm not cool enough to be fully yacht rock because I know that's actually cool again. <laughs> you know, like, no, I mean, it is a little bit like, you know, like Thundercat is having like Kenny and Michael mm. McDonald guest and mm. those guys, because it's, it's, uh, it's a bit Hasselhoffish. It's like, mm. Uh, funny, but it's really actually a tribute. Like those guys love mm. that music too, you know. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's kind of I don't know. You listened anyway, to some about? yacht rock that I was uh, working on. Uh, I'm, I'm I did producing another artist. Yeah. And when and I'll, I'll actually I'll ask you about your involvement in that too. And and you said uh, that the some of the chord sequences. That, yeah. So that is this. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
That's like the what a fool believes. Yeah, and that well, was the thing that that uh, that you did that on there. Yeah. Right. And you, you did like, something like that. And you said that um, there was a there was you can probably pinpoint the year that your father refused to ever use that sort of descending triads. Uh. Yeah, it was probably like eighty seven. Oh, that's pretty and it was, late then. Pretty it late was. Then. I mean, it, yeah, it was about that. But then it was also this chord. He couldn't. He would never write anything where he would use that chord ever again. So. Those were the two things that became off limits. Wow, because I think I've got a couple of things that become. I suppose that's just a pet hate, though, isn't it? Really, I mean, there's nothing wrong with. It. It's beautiful. It is, yeah, but it just became so overused, I guess. Yeah. Um, just like that chord sequence did at a time, but it's cool again. It's a great chord sequence. I mean, that's come on. Wrong with it. Nothing. It wrong makes with you it. feel great. It like gets you. You know, I feel like it's encouraging you to go about your day you know yeah with a spring in your stride <laughs> exactly <laughs> looking right. for a, somewhere to moor or whatever it is you do, you do, you know? right um so exactly. does your when you open your wardrobe um mm. are there hawaiian shirts in there no 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 oh. no it's That's nothing far, that, with it? buttons really yeah oh, no. it's really just t-shirts and jeans and yeah. shoes <laughs> perhaps Simple. a hawaiian t-shirt would be good <laughs> maybe yeah i mean yeah. it would if yeah it's i don't know see that's another that's kind of like so where my parents live in southern california it's like a lot of that and like people uh, who have been in flip-flops and like those but mm. they're super sunburned and have skin cancer and like oh. kind of it's just like a weird it's like that gone wrong oh okay so that's part of the rebellion so it's but like yeah your, like jazz the yacht rock was being done by the sort of toxic avenger type vibe <laughs> Possibly, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so that you're yeah, saying the biggest pitfalls of the yacht rock music industry would oh, be skin cancer. That's what we were talking about. Oh my god, <laughs> Jesus okay, Christ! You have to remember to put sunblock on, um, oh, avoiding man. the uh, avoding the descending <laughs> triads and the. Doo -doo -doo okay, chord. <laughs> okay, I got it. The biggest pitfall of the music industry is expecting anything out of it. Oh. That's the biggest. That's that's the biggest pitfall. No. The only way to survive is to eat dirt for potentially your whole life age zero right? to age 87 when you die or 62 for malnutrition <laughs> and expect nothing and then just be really grateful when something happens and know that that's totally temporary and keep on working as if that one thing never happened oh, <laughs> geez. that's what i think that is fucking brilliant i really think that's <laughs> like that is exactly it that's exactly it, yeah. because yeah, so many, so. so many of the sort of questions that I get asked, um, you know, outside of, you know, the comments and so on. How do you, how can you do this and how do you do that? And it's like there isn't the reason why there's no answers to that is because it's such a difficult. I mean, you don't even know. I don't even know how to gauge success anymore. I don't know what success means. You know. So. Yep just to be fulfilled in the process is is the goal right that's the thing totally yeah yeah i mean like when you know when i talk to lewis or i t like i know jacob collier a little bit and when i talk to jacob it's like or you know like i'm just citing like two guys you know who are doing really well in their respective fields and they're very successful but in a totally new way, you know, mm. like they're not successful in a traditional music industry way. Mm. But when you talk to either of them, they're just excited about the process, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like I just talked to them about music or what they're working on or like, you know, Lewis texts me all the time like, dude, so when you're doing your hi-hat pedal, do you like float up here? Or, you know, like he, he's he's just working on his thing all day, you know. He's mm. like – he just barely sleeps and just works all day every day, yeah. you know. So, you know, my I, I might have told you this, but my my little girl is a massive Lewis Cole fan. You did tell me that. Yeah, yeah. it was like it was like Rick James and Lewis Cole, and she <laughs> likes Lewis because he plays all the instruments. Yeah. Just, yeah. Those two, that's great. It's but, really uh, cool. I mean, you know, she's starting to sort of move away from that now that she's at school, and the other kids are showing her stuff that I wish. They I saw you said Taylor Swift. Yeah, I, I, mean, I watched more recent too. So. I don't really mind that, to be honest, because I think that yeah. at least there's a bit of craft in the songwriting and stuff. But yeah, for sure. I mean, and also there's something sort of what she likes about Taylor Swift is there's a there's a 
There's something in her voice when she starts a note cold, where it sort of gears mm -hmm. up and shreds a bit just before it, the true note oh, comes yeah. through, you know. And she likes that. And so she's what she's really excited about is the affectation in her voice. And I, I like that too because I think, I mean, Jacob Collier is probably the most talented person outside of this Zoom call, right? And, um, <laughs> no, he's the best musician in the world for sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's no question. He's astounding. Yep. But I always feel like when you hear his voice just in its, in its I mean, it's just so pure. It's mm -hmm. such a pure voice um, that I don't feel like it has the kind of character that, that turns on somebody that my, that's my daughter's age somehow. Yeah. So that's, that really is something that more of a connoisseur would, would learn to appreciate. And, and like the way he uses it is incredibly, it's ingenious, you know, it's, it's amazing. And it's and he's obviously perfect pitch and all that stuff, but I just think there's there are some vocalists that aren't perfect that kids prefer to listen to somehow. And I don't know. Yeah, well, why. I have a couple questions for you. Doesn't she, doesn't she just kind of do a slight vocal fry before she comes in with the note, like the uh, and then the note comes? Isn't Maybe that part of what it. it is? Is that what vocal I mean, fry what, is? Yeah, uh, that's vocal fry. Okay. So I mean, that's how most singers sing now, is they do that ramping up, which yeah. kind of ensures like more of a chesty delivery. I've been told. I don't know. Okay. But I was going to say too that a modern singers my age, Jacob's age, they didn't really like go into bars and play guitar and try to sing to the back of the room ever. Yeah, yeah. They sang in their bedroom, and the first time they got on stage, they had in they had in ears. Yeah. So they never had to learn to like do mm. that. They never had to learn to project. Yeah. You know, kind of myself included. Like you never had to like learn to sing from the chest and get a voice that grabs people. You know, when I was became doing, like more whisper core. Uh, yeah, when I was doing that improv stuff, that's the first time I sang in front of an audience, mm. and and um, I was just roaring, <laughs> just roaring. And then like in the uh, in the on the first start of this record, I listened to that and I was like, "There's no fucking way I'd sing like that." Again, you know. I have a question for you about that. Because uh, I listened to that record and I was like, dude, the singing is like, holy crap. Like, it, there's like the third line where it's just like by the third line of the first song. I'm like, like on the train going like this, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> and you sing better than that now. But there was part of me that was like, there's no way he could sing. There's no way that you could do that for th 20 years and not break something yeah i Am did I break right? something funnily you enough. did yeah okay because you did take vocal lessons because like when i hear you sing now mm. uh it's technically it's better yeah and you, you there's more you can do you can still do the high stuff and you can do still do power but you can do like more flexible stuff and i saw you doing like straw stuff and stuff too so uh, I know, yeah like, you saw that yeah yeah that's that's Which, um yeah. that was oh when i had my i had a polyp on my vocal cords Oh, and I think that's because I tried to do a song about three or four albums ago, where I was sort of going into a character that, and I thought I was doing vocal fry, but I wasn't. I was just fucking yelling, you know. I was basically okay. like a, a a guy on the market trying to sell apples to someone <laughs> that's fifty meters away, you know. I was that's how it was, and I, it was it was unbelievably loud and really damaging, and I never really kind of got control of that again afterwards. Uh -huh. So I did like a couple of tours where it got worse and worse. And you would do that song live, yeah. And oh, okay. and it would be like what happened was we did a we did a I had to I had a, we had a tour in the UK. I sang so horribly on the first night. I was like, okay, this is I got to go to the hospital and see what's going on. So I went to the local ENT. They put a camera down there and saw this <laughs> enormous polyp right in the middle of my vocal cords. Oh, and it was like, God. this thing's not going to fall off. You're going to get you're going to need to get that cut off. And I was like, I'm not cancelling a whole tour. So I sang the whole tour with this polyp and found a way to sing around it, which is why I don't know. I've I've probably got a bit more distortion on the on the higher stuff that I do now, which you know is because I was using like flaps of skin around the back there to get around that. And trying to visualize sending the sending the sound elsewhere, so I didn't have to rely on that middle part of my vocal cords. If you see what I mean. Um, and then when they cut it off, obviously that was a slightly worrying procedure because they, they, it's cold steel. They just go in and cut off the the thing that's hanging off there. I had I had two weeks of uh, silence, another two weeks of library speaking, and then I gradually got into it and into it. And then the first first thing we had to do was a tour of America. I mean. Oh my God. I think Taylor was at the first gig we did there, actually, and and, and it was really like, is this going to work? <laughs> you know. But they showed me a lot of stuff in the aftercare for that procedure that really changed my approach to singing. 
And um, one of my texts is a bit of a, you know, much more of a muser than he lets on. And he said, it's like you've opened a box with a load of new mm. stuff in it. And so in a way, fucking my voice up was, was a good thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I learned, I learned a lot about what, how to sort of, I don't know, just utilize different parts of it and not kill myself. <laughs> yeah, and be able to do it for a long time. Because, like, my parents started going to vocal, taking vocal lessons in their 30s. Mm. They're in their mid-70s. Mm. And they sing like they're 23. I mean, they're just, like, super power, super control, super dynamics, no pitch wavering. Mm. And all of their peers who didn't do that mm. are have really messed so up So you think that's... I mean, one of the, some of the early stuff that I was doing on this channel, I was talking about like the state of, uh, for example, John Bon Jovi's voice. There was a lot of really quite upsetting footage of, of him not, not being able to carry the songs in the same mm -hmm. way. Do you think that's just lack of training then or, or some sort of mm -hmm. other kind of negligence in terms of how they maintain their instrument? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it seems like it because, I mean, you know, opera singers can do that for and not hurt themselves I think probably mm. you know and they're singing way louder than John Bon Jovi ever was yeah so uh, if you do it correctly I mean I'm just so I'm told from my parents then yeah you're not you're not going to hurt yourself mm. um, and you just figure out ways around it I mean like even James Hetfield like I'm a Metallica fan like yeah. I've loved Metallica forever and but he totally changed the way he sings you know mm. And I watched a lot of those videos of them doing like Master of Puppets live, you know, like when this mm. new record came out. And it's like, oh, yeah, he just sounds like he's a better singer. Like he can sing all these things he couldn't sing before. And he knows mm. how to sing these things and not hurt himself. Mm. And he sounds great for his age. But he's like a lion on stage, you know, like yeah. you shouldn't be able to, do, able to do that in your 50s and 60s. Yeah. The only way you can do that is if you train, you know. So, yeah. So I'm glad, yeah, that's that's interesting because that was a question I had when I heard that first record. I was like, oh, man, <laughs> yeah, you figured some stuff out because there's no way you could still Yeah, do that I mean, I, don't, I, was never, <laughs> I was never really, the only time I had any sort of guidance with that was when I had a problem. So it was kind of like, let's just mm -hmm. try and keep my voice on the road or do it like a big TV appearance or something like that when I needed to be good, you know. Mm -hmm. And they'd come in and they'd look at me and just warm me up and... Pat me on the ass and say you're off. You're good to go. Get on there, lad. You're, you're ready. And then, and I think a lot of that was just psychological, anyway. Uh -huh. um, well, I don't know about that. I mean, it's definitely it's it's not it's. Well, I think in that so instance I'm, it was. You know, when they were when they yeah, were just trying to get me going for a for a one-off TV thing or something. You know? Right, but I have like a lot of jazz friends who are like really trained, you know, mm. and they're like really like this singer, good friend of mine, Michael Mayo, who's kind of maybe the best jazz vocalist alive slash ever like mm. he's uh he can improvise with full harmonic control the way like a modern saxophone player can where it's not like licks or you know mm. jazz language that you've heard other people sing it's like full control over the harmony and just any amount of and he's improvising off what you played and uh, but he can sing full and chesty and like um, you know R and B or kind of can kind of do anything. But yeah, he's fully trained and does warm ups and like he's he's just making sure he takes care of his his instrument, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that's like that's like that's just what you do when you're like a classical classically trained singer is you just mm -hmm. do that, which is interesting, you know. Yeah. I don't know. It's like yeah, but like and then you had like Paul McCartney or like you had like. John Lennon who was doing like scream therapy which is like that's the worst thing you could do for your voice for like long term <laughs> like, health if you, you know <laughs> if you want to have no control over your voice <laughs> then do the scream I mean the scream therapy <laughs> I mean maybe it helped on some like you know primal level with some other stuff he was dealing with but yeah for his your voice yeah. I mean holy crap anyway yeah okay one more question for you go on so I was listening to your record the record that was it's like you on the cover with your face and hair, and then everybody's hanging off of you. Oh, and yeah. And Rufus, is, was Rufus's first record with you? It was, yeah. That was called Pinewood Smile. Right. It, awesome record, like great songs, and like Rufus is just slaying. Like the drumming yeah. is like so good, like right away super exciting. Mm -hmm. Also, like I thought like no click, and I've seen that you've, you've said yeah. that before, no yeah. click. And like things move around the corners like they should like the way that zeppelin records like it's like bonnet would like 
hit a crash sim will kind of take a nap and then like come up for the next one and like maybe take another nap and then just play a crazy fill and then like the groove is super solid and it doesn't move yeah. and like that's that felt like Rufus's own version of that but what it got me thinking was like oh you know why rock is dead because of the click track oh. <laughs> Because that removes the entire visceral experience of the ro- of rock and roll. Like, Shit, yeah. Because I, I was like, I'm listening to a rock band right now in 2023, and, like, this is a real effing rock band. Like, you guys sound like a real – it's a real rock band. Why is that? Oh, it's because time is the – the time moving is the fifth member of the band <laughs> that you can't duplicate any other way. Yeah. Like, all of those classic records, none of them had click tracks, even though the Beatles – all that, all the Beatles records were, were great tempo and stuff like that, but it's still you can't replicate the way that a band moves together, mm. and it's that makes it so much more exciting and like kind of visceral and like kind I of mean, unpredictable. Uh, you, we've always struggled with click tracks anyway because like um, yeah. you do them and then you play them, and drummers don't generally like using them, do they? I mean, it's just I mean I know there's probably an application for it when there's electronic elements and so on, and then you have to be really really on it. But when mm-hmm. you're doing rock and roll stuff, it's like you want to feel the excitement in the rhythm section, and they yeah. need to be racing off with it, because, and then sort of get hold of themselves and go, "Oh, hang on a second, then oh wait, I can't do this next bit, and we're going too fast." <laughs> and then how do you adjust to that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Um, or, or, but also it, there's that. But also, um, it that record also felt like nobody was thinking about that. Nobody was thinking about time. Mm. In a good way. Like, mm-hmm. it, it was funky, it rocked, it was solid, you guys were tight, but things moved when they needed to move, and nobody was like, oh, it sped up or slowed down there, because you can also mm. hear people thinking about that. Mm. But that really got me thinking, like, man, if rock music sounded like this again, people would listen to it. Like, mm. if, peop- if, if it had that freedom and that kind of excitement, I think that's what the genre is missing. Yeah. Um, but oh, that's uh, true. I, I for- I mean, I, I, forgot I, I, do, I was... a bit, do a bit of DJing, you know, and, and like um, I do digital DJing because I can't be bothered yeah. to carry records around. Um, and whenever I'm doing anything that sort of has a fluid tempo that's difficult for the software to analyze and mm. come up with a legit sort of, you know, an actual tempo for it, those are the, that's the stuff that I enjoy playing the most. <laughs> it's really difficult right. to blend out of it and stuff, but it's obviously, it just sounds better. To my I mean, and most people connect to music that wasn't recorded with click tracks too. I mean, mm. it's like the, I mean, all the old music is was pre that. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, but it really does sound like uh, it really does sound like there's more information happening. Mm. You know, uh, it really sounds like there's 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 extra music happening without having to add extra overdubs. You know, yeah. my my wife's band, the Felice mm. Brothers. Um, she plays bass in this great band, um, and I just recorded their new record. Uh, uh, I kind of produced it, engineered it, mixed it, mastered it, whatever, sort of produced it. I don't know, whatever. Brought all my gear up. But, yeah, they're just a band. No click. You know, the stuff mm-hmm. moves. And there was one song where it was like they <laughs> they wanted to, you know, they were like, they brought this song and they were learning it. They wanted it kind of produced quickly, all that stuff. And I was like, ah, I'm hearing it like way faster so i turned on a click just to be like this is the tempo i'm hearing yeah. and it, it they couldn't do it i had to turn the click off right i mean yeah right away i was just like oh my god this is not going to work but it was better because it got them in the place where yeah. they could hear the song faster and not and not do it with the click but there's their records have that same thing where it's just like oh yeah this is a band playing together and they could just play as a four piece and that's enough information that's all i want to hear you know that is such an interesting mm-hmm. uh theory that the click Kill kill, rock and is roll. killing rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I yeah. remember when we did the the second record. Um, we did some demos without the click, um, and it was, obviously it was our original drummer. It was it was, um, it was Ed Graham on that, um, and so he would have a thing where he'd come up to a fill, and you could feel him sort of getting tense when it was time for it to. To, for him to do it and then and then he'd play the fill and then oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, no, no. after it, after the final crash to, to conclude matters <clears throat> he'd almost sort of mop his brow and then carry on at his leisure and there was a lot of fluidity in those demos that we wanted to get <clears throat> on the thing 
But because it felt like a fluke, we decided to do a tempo map with a click, which accommodated all those sort of retards and you know the bits that sped up and everything. Um, and it was impossible. We took about of course it cost. <laughs> I mean, we spent so much time just trying to recreate something that really we should Happen have just been organic. doing takes, you know, just, <laughs> just go for it. Yeah. Well, I have I have two uh, things to say about that. First of all, my dad was around for the beginning of, of drum machines. Mm. Uh, and he, him and all of his friends were sure that the drum machines were slowing down in the fills. Like they would program a fill and they were like, why does it slow down when it plays a fill that I programmed? Because they were used to hearing drummers play a click or two faster. Yeah. That's just their brains were programmed to hear like, you know, yeah. just like the slight little movement of time. Mm. They were used to that. Mm. And so they they had to recalibrate to like, oh, perfect time actually sounds like this. Like mm. they had no idea. So, you know, nobody knew what that was. But also I was going to say like when we were doing those Wembley shows, like – so I got to see like Lars play. I got to see mm. Stuart play. Mm -hmm. The drummer from the Pretenders. What's his name? Oh, um, oh, what's his name? Martin Chambers. Yes. <laughs> and I hung out with Ru Rufus a bunch that <laughs> that that over that week or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. and Rufus is like, man, that guy's he's a he's a character. You know, like a kind yeah. of a live wire, um, which is probably okay to see because when I saw him play, I was just like, oh my god! I felt like like he might die and he almost might kill me like from the side <laughs> of the stage like yeah. there was there was so much intensity but like what i felt about like seeing those guys is a lot about the way that like jazz used to sound like mm. like the old jazz drummers like elvin jones or tony williams or like you know the guys from the 60s mm. you kind of thought that you might die or they might die mm. on stage it was that mm. same kind of visceral like holy you know and like that um certainly no click track there like same thing with that music too i think like the the self-consciousness of jazz kind of of tempo kind of could have killed that music too but mm. anyway those great guys great rock drummers who are older now are starting i felt like they're kind of starting to take on this like spiritual visceralness that like the great jazz drummers had you know mm. like because i got to see elvin before he died and it was like seeing a spirit or something it was like yeah and seeing Lars was kind of like seeing Elvin. Like it was like, yeah. it was so weird. I mean, obviously different styles and all that stuff, but it was that same thing of like, he's been playing drums for so long now. His sound is so imprinted on my head. Yeah. I don't know if you remember this, but do you remember this where his drum tech went out, played his snare drum three times from here, like yeah. as hard as he could, yeah. you know? And then Lars got on the kit, broke the snare drum in two hits. Do you remember that? <laughs> No, I don't remember that. Yeah. Wow. So he was like, ka, ka, and then it was like, boom, boom, snare drum's broken. Just like, and he'd already done the Lars test, but it, it you know, Lars, Wasn't nobody can do the sufficient. Lars test except for Lars. Yeah. So he had to like replace it. Anyway. So you, you, you gotta got to love Lars, so. haven't you? He gets a bit of a bad rap sometimes. Dude, but there's something... he's a great drummer. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I was so pumped up. Like, I was so excited to see... Like, the way he made the audience feel, mm. everybody was excited, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, you can't you can't say somebody's a bad drummer when they can do that. When you can, like, yeah. make 80,000 people, like, go, like, oh, my God. Like, yeah. then you're a great. Like, I don't yeah. care if you can play, like, a fast single stroke roll or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So, also, it's like his sound over the kick drum, oh, the, over the, uh, the mains, it was like I was listening to Metallica, but then it was like, the singer from ACDC, I was just like, man, this is, this really is like a dream. It was so weird. It was an, what an amazing night. Man, yeah. Thank you. Totally. Um, okay, that's so. my second question. Okay, Jesus. <laughs> 45 sorry. minutes. I, I had coffee. An, we're an hour yeah, in. Yeah, sorry. Um, oh my God, no way. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of editing. Oh, no, man, this is awesome. <laughs> Seriously, it's great. Jesus. Um, okay, so what are you, what are the, what are the best things about working in the music industry? Okay. So meeting people like you, honestly, like meeting people where it's like, man, kind of different musical world, but like kindred spirit in a way. Like I knew it right away. Like I met you in the car and I was like, man, I like that guy. Why? 
<laughs> like right away you know but it was like a dog thing it was like an energy thing well, but, yeah, um, but we were sniffing each other's asses as well <laughs> yeah i mean that's it, you know? as is customary in the musical world yeah <laughs> but um uh no but just like yeah i think the people is the coolest thing and like everybody is doing the thing where they're eating dirt for so long and mm. then you come up to like make eye contact with somebody and be like oh man i like what you're doing oh i like what you're doing mm. or not even that just to relate on a human level and just be like but everybody's doing something that's so weird, you know? Mm. Like, music is so weird. It's so uncommercial and it's so, like, personal. And then to meet people that are, I don't know, that far in that you jive with is super cool. And then also just to, like, okay, that night, like, just to see all those people and then, like, you know, uh, like hang out with Paul McCartney, for instance, like yeah. <laughs> whatever, like th like those moments where you're like, oh, wow, like, you know, I'm kind of I'm kind of alive because of Paul McCartney in a way. Yeah, I think we you all know? are. <laughs> I am. Yeah, we all are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, my dad can really trace the moment where it's like Paul is the reason that like all these things, you know, yeah. which probably seven billion people can say that. Yeah. You know, but then for me to be like, oh, I met him, got to talk to him a little bit and stuff like that is like. Man, the music industry is yeah. so cool. Yeah, that's like, cause true. I don't know, and 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 also, and it's not just business at that point. It's like because maybe there are other businesses that are like that, but they're just business. This mm. is like no, I admire you as a hero of you know music, and I don't know. It's just that's it's so cool to 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 get to experience that. Yeah. So, I think. What What about you? What's your oh, greatest the... thing about it? <laughs> Oh shit! Have you not answered this before? I don't think I have actually. What? But if I had to choose a thing, I would say, I would say, part of the thrill of being involved in the music trade for a period of time is watching the evolution or the devolution, and seeing how people hustle and scrap, and then just watching this moment when like in you know aside from the the silty sewagey pop music which i always malign there's this stuff that rises up and it has to be fucking amazing to make any sort of impact and everybody's mm. working harder people are more talented i don't know what's going on but there's something happening to the human race where i just think the musicians are, are way better than they've ever been it's yeah, part, maybe it's partly the technology that's associated with it, or maybe it's like just because the, the competition is so fierce. I just think it's like there's nobody, nobody that I admire rests on their laurels. They're always doing stuff, and it's always kind of there's just a lot more weird stuff around than there was before, and the weird stuff is the stuff that excites me. <laughs> yeah, so me I think it's just like I'm, I've enjoy, I enjoy. The best thing about being in the trade is watching cynicism and money grabbing and all that stuff fail and watching the art survive and, and prevail. You know, it's kind of, I just feel like there are a lot of douchebag A&R people who were basically unnecessary. <laughs> there were gatekeepers and there were people that st that stopped things that weren't deemed cool or you know weren't they didn't see them as being capable of capturing the zeitgeist so and they were wrong a lot of the time that seeing those people make mistakes and then realize and then the trade realizing that those guys can't be trusted <laughs> you know, they don't they don't get that they don't get to do that anymore you know, there's probably a couple of legendary ones that are still going because they've had such amazing track records. But actually, what really matters is the music. And we're finally getting to this point where it's like, they're just trying to find a way to monetize the stuff that's great. They're not trying to tell you what's great anymore. We're finding it out and telling each other. And that's, I think that's beautiful. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's a, that's a positive way to look at it. I remember, so my mom's a musician too. I remember when I was probably six or seven, we were driving home from the supermarket and she said, you know, what's going to happen in the music industry is that it's going to, all the money is going to leave and the only people that are going to be left are the people who don't have a choice and all they can do is music. Yeah. 
You know, everybody who has a choice is going to leave the industry, but the only people that will be left are the people who have to do it. I was like, oh, wow, that's a right. great <laughs> observation, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. she totally nailed that. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, but I was going to say, yes, the technology, like the drum, the level of drummers now is so effed. Mm. It's so crazy how good drummers are now. Yeah. Like 15-year-olds, like just so good. I mean, you you probably know Dobby and JD back. Do you know those, do you know those guys? No, actually. Okay, so they're they're kind of... They're Lewis. They're in the Lewis world. Like okay. JD is, uh, he's a Lewis, and actually DeAnthony Parks, Techno Self, mm-hmm. protege. Their record came out on uh, Anderson Pax label. Anderson produced it, mm-hmm. and that is a weird record. I mean, it's not a weird record. It is a weird record. They're just shredding, mm-hmm. and they're like JD's like. I don't know, 18, maybe he's 19 now, but it, he was that good when he was 16. Mm-hmm. And Domi's this uh, French piano player. She sounds kind of like a MIDI role, you know, like take whatever jazz solo you can think of, speed it up to 400 BPM. That's what she sounds like, but she's mm-hmm. playing it in real time. Mm-hmm. This is all because of technology. It totally mm-hmm. is. Like to me, Jacob is like the first and best example of a YouTube channel come to life. Yeah. Like if you could take like 4,000 YouTube channels and turn them into a human, like that's what Jacob is. Mm. There's no way he could have existed before this mm. amount of music and information. Couldn't have happened. Yeah. But because he has like – he has so much like uh, – he has access to all the music in the world so he can just absorb it the way that he absorbs music, which I know for a fact is just like – he eats a genre whole at a sitting, you know. Yeah. But that's because, you know. I enjoyed what said, one of his recent tracks, which was, uh, I, I think I covered it, and it was actually reminded me of Living Color or something like that. It had this kind of... Um, he plays guitar on it. Yeah, it's a real rocker. Yeah, I, I heard that too. Which I shocked by. Yeah, he's, he can do anything. And I've seen shows, I've seen a few of his shows now, and his thing is that it's, Every song is so technicolor that it's hard to pick out what color he's going for, sort of, sometimes, mm. you know? Mm. Like, but there will be hints of that in a, in, a, in a show where you're like, oh, that's a pure color, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. And that for, song to me sounded like, oh, that sounded like a It was a pretty concise a bit of rocking, actually. Yeah, it's good. Totally. Um, it got interesting towards the end as, as I was sort of waiting for it to do. But I know what you mean. I was, sort of, I was listening to it and I was thinking, okay, when is it going to take the left turn that leaves the people that are excited about the rock being cold and it didn't right. happen it was a really concise sort of piece of writing i thought i was quite surprised by it really and obviously it had all the harmonies and the harmonic information that you'd expect but but, it but it's was like just a song you could cover <laughs> yeah <laughs> which you can't cover a jacob collier song usually because <laughs> yeah, it's just too yeah. much you know like a yeah, acoustic no, no, guitar no, cover I, I didn't think about that but actually that song would probably would be the one that a pub band might try and take on there you go, <laughs> yeah. and fall dreadfully short. <laughs> <laughs> I saw I saw a quote today on Instagram, and Instagram never lies. Um, that True. Paul McCartney said, "Like if you can play your music in a pub, then you're a good band." Which you know, mm. it sounds like that's maybe the type of thing he said, but yeah, I don't know. I think if you can play your music in a pub, then I know. I think that perhaps what I would have said is like if you can play your music in the same pub twice. Then you're a good oh, band, yeah. Because right. anybody can get a gig and then fuck it up, can't they? Right. So. Yeah, I think he meant if it, I think he meant if it goes over in a pub, like if people like oh, it. Oh, okay, sorry. You know, I was, I thought, uh, he wasn't just talking about having a demo tape that's sufficient to get you a gig at a pub. Right. Yeah, I think. Yeah, he I wouldn't have been he saying that, would he? <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking. <laughs> May, uh, there might have been a character limit to the, you know. Oh the, yeah, he tweeted it. Something. I think. Yeah. Yeah, or it was just like it was over an image that it was, could only fit this much. <laughs> information <laughs> or it was down there but you just didn't scroll you didn't keep scrolling. right click for more <laughs> disclaimers and all that stuff here's all right so. i've got another question for you okay do you think that there's actually two music industries um and then there's so one of them is the super commercial side uh which has got taylor swift harry styles um the imagine dragons um and then you have, and then is there a second one, which is like the grassroots music industry with working musicians and professionals working in the music scene? Or has the former destroyed the latter? And what are we talking about here? Musical apocalypse or what? <laughs> Man, good question. I never think about it. I mean, 
Yeah, I, it's amazing that Imagine Dragons is in the same sentence as Taylor Swift. That's cool. Do you know what I always think about Imagine Dragons? What? I think it's um, basically... <laughs> it's a mainstream music version of uh, the Blue Man Group. Okay. But without the blueness, I suppose. Just normal, col- right. normal coloured men. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to, you know, not to disrespect anybody, but I just feel like it's, no. I think there's a lot of um, performative striking of drums that are positioned in an unusual way. You'd almost expect them to sort of, um, do you know what I mean? It's, it's no, all a bit. It's really funny because actually, if I think about any any genre of music, the band that makes it, like even the like Dylan Basement Tapes folksy band is the Blue Man v- group version of Dylan Basement Tapes. It's always the Blue Man group version of. I never thought of that until just now. But that's like, yeah, you're right. There's some per- performative element to it. It's interesting. But so to answer your question, try not to have another hour long. Um, <laughs> I know segue. you've got to go somewhere today. Haven't you? It's, uh, don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, or um, yeah, I mean, I think I think they're just they're just trying to hang on as long as they can. Like they're just cats like scraping down the side of a brick building that they can't get their fingernails into, right. you know? And uh, this is why, like, man, I, how depressing is it that they're buying out, like, Dylan and Bruce Springsteen mm. and Neil Young and all these people are selling their catalogs because all, let's face it, all those people, are all those, like, music industry people are realizing that's where the money is and has always been and will always be. There's not going to be money in whatever the new stuff is. We have to make holograms of Bruce Springsteen. We own his catalog. We can make money off that forever. Oh, is that why they're doing that? You think to make yes. a hologram? Yeah, they're going to make. They're going to make. They're going to reuse that music because they're looking at Spotify numbers. They're looking at, you know, you remaster a Bruce Springsteen thing and then add a song, and people buy it all over again like it's the first time, and they're like, we can keep doing this forever. You know, yeah. and that's that's how I see it. And like when I go to like the children's pre- playground, for instance, which is right across the street from me, and it's the most multicultural playground probably in the world. Like <laughs> Queens is the most uh, the most diverse area, like square area of the world. Like, mm. uh, and this playground is basically that. But they're all singing Michael Jackson and like stuff I was singing when I was their age. Yeah. You know, it's like they're not singing. Even Taylor Swift, they're singing mm. old music. Mm. So I think, I think my answer to that is really just like those are the only guys that are going to make it into that same old guard that's going to make any money, and eventually somebody's going to buy Taylor Swift's catalog. I never really you understood know. that catalog buying thing though, because the way it used to be, you write a song, and then perhaps, God forbid, at some point, I mean, I know that you and I have already talked about sharing a cryogenic chamber so that we can live forever thus keeping our, our royalties for, for beyond the sort of 70 years after our demise but we won't technically be dead we'll just be frozen <laughs> so we can keep cashing in and our estates can you know keep paying for the f- deep freeze you know do you, you know i have a song about that right what <laughs> seriously yeah yeah i have two songs about that on my first four record <laughs> <laughs> I told you, I knew we were the same. <laughs> <laughs> one is one is written from the perspective of a bunny rabbit whose brain they they took, and he's he's um, talking about like, oh well, they promised that they'll bring me back and stuff like that because <laughs> they actually did. There there is actually they they froze a rabbit's brain and were able to thought in a way so that they could see that it would work again. Wow. So that song was written from the perspective of that rabbit who was like yeah they'll this will be cool right and then the the song after that was like about somebody who cryogenically freezes himself yeah so anyway so yeah just sorry for the sake yeah, no, yeah it's brilliant. that's gonna um, be a thing yeah so okay well so you and i are gonna do that that's obvious yeah but i think for the for the artists that have sold those kind of things does that mean that they cash in on mm-hmm. all of their sort of recorded and written works They have this enormous, I'm just, let's say it's $500 million, right? But then they don't have any control over how their catalog is exploited. It's not their problem anymore. They wash their hands off it, but they sort of retire happily and they apportion the money to their 
offspring and so on. Meanwhile, the label who's invested in that spends the next 200 years, assuming the planet's still going, exploiting it with a hologram or some other kind of cybernetic... I, th uh, I think so. I haven't read too much into it, and I don't think anybody would let you if you tried to, but... Like, uh, you know, just seeing like Neil Young justified, he's like, I've worked my butt off for my entire life. Why shouldn't I just cash in and feel like I'll be cool? You know, I don't it's think like, anybody yeah, would do begrudge that. them. Yeah, nobody begrudges no. them that. But I mean, nobody would. Because especially but, but, some of those guys, they were around when the music trade really was ripping off artists and, the, and like the, the really significant money that they should have made probably didn't, you know, <laughs> they're yeah. doing stuff in the but 60s then, and 70s. But at the same time, they also made way more money than anybody after them will ever make, even though they yeah. were getting ripped off. Yeah, you know, so it's kind of a weird, kind of a weird catch twenty two, but yeah, I think probably there are things in their clause like you can't use this for Super Bowl Sunday until I'm dead or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, who knows? Who yeah. knows what the clause is? But clearly, why are they doing? Why are all of these artists selling their rec their their catalogs at the same time? There's got to be a reason. Why are they spending all this? Do money you not on think this, it might know? be something like the NFT trend, where like it's just a thing? It's a thing that's happening just in this moment, and it's like, okay, so that's how they're investing in the future. And then yeah, let's, but let's but I don't it. think like like you said, I don't think record labels are that smart to be able to think that far ahead of like NFTs or like what's the next blockchain technology going to be. Mm. They're just thinking like, man, Bruce Springsteen streams amazingly. Mm. What if we own that catalog forever? And what if we could just rework it and rework it, and so it keeps getting, you know, like. We release a Bruce Springsteen movie like the Beatles, you know, Let It Be movie, which came mm. out. And then it's just like the Beatles are as big as they've ever been. You know, mm. like you just keep doing that and keep doing that. And you don't really have to invest in new talent. You just keep, mm. you know, that's what I think is happening. Wow. So, so yes. So there's that. And then there's the other music industry. There's the Lewis Cole music industry where you mm. just like, you know, go play like wherever you can and just whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Make shirts that say I don't care and and – that's it, you know. I'd but do, I think they're completely they're completely separate, and they used to be like one was leading to the other, but now I think they're com on completely different tracks. Yeah, that's, like, a, that's a good different... point as well. I feel like so, the the second grass the grassroots one would aspire to be in the in the you know the dominant one, but mm -hmm. the grassroots one. The really interesting stuff that's happening there is completely eschewing the values of this one, and so. And, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point. And there's one thing I will add, which maybe I, I only, only I have uh, the experience to make this comparison, but the only thing that I can think of that compares to this in terms of the music industry is jazz. Mm. Because jazz is a live art form, and there's so many jazz festivals all over the place. But why? Nobody really likes jazz. Mm. <laughs> Who are the new jazz artists? It's like it's it's, it's 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 its own culture that kind of like uh, just ensures its own kind of uh, perpetuity in a way. Yeah. And I feel like these people are kind of looking more at that than they are at like, oh, I want to keep doing this when I'm 70 as yeah. opposed to like, oh, I want to sell my catalog when I'm 70. Yeah. You know, what happens in Switzerland is like you might not pay as much tax in, in other places, but you are obliged to sort of give yourself a pension. So you have to contribute to that. And there's a lot of mandatory kind of health insurance things that you have to pay for. But it always galls me to contribute to a pension fund because I will never stop doing music. <laughs> you know? yeah. And I'll never stop earning on royalties. You know what I mean? Right. It's like I don't, it doesn't apply to us. You know, we're lifers. That's, that's it's what true. we are, you know. I mean, I will say you could go deaf, you could go blind, you could, you know, completely injure your voice so you couldn't be able to sing. I think those are the only things that that was <laughs> guarantee. Why? Did... I'm sorry. <laughs> there's so but, many uh, revelations. You've been a brilliant guest. <laughs> but at the same time, that's heartbreaking. It is. I know. <laughs> the, the, you're right. The health, the health is a lottery. Yeah. But I think if you're a songwriter, you know you will earn on the stuff that you've written as it's exploited and if you have a proactive publisher you're, sh you're probably not going to need a pension are you? I mean I don't know I mean I've never even th considered making money on music in any kind of mailbox way so that's yeah. great if that can happen that's awesome I mean if you so the thing is if you lose your voice then you'll just concentrate I don't on, the, sing. on the drums yeah I mean I'm you not know, a singer you, anyway so. well, I've heard you sing you but, sing but, but I mean, if, you, if I lost my hearing, for instance... Oh, that's a different matter. You know yeah. what I mean? If you lose your hearing, you're, you're effed. That's it's done. 
And you never know when that, if or when that's going to happen. You kind of know genetically, like genetically, actually hearing is genetic, hearing loss. Yeah. Like if your father or mother, how, however their hearing is doing, that's probably how your ears will be. Yeah, improved. but they say that about baldness. And my father's bald. My mother's bald. Her grandmother was bald. Um, my, my father's father's bald. Um, all of our well, pets. Your mother's father. Uh, that's the one. Yeah, bald. Okay. Bald. Um, so then you're some weird freak. You're great. Well, I pray a lot and I eat, I do eat a lot of cauliflower. <laughs> so... <laughs> Cauliflower? <laughs> cauliflower, yeah. Cauliflower That's great. And prayer. And then, lo and behold, the miracle <laughs> occurs. I saw but Ringo the, said I can't grow broccoli. a beard, though. That's the thing that's really annoying me. You know. Oh, really? Okay. Mm. <laughs> Small price to pay. Um, yeah. yeah, I saw Ringo said broccoli. So there's something about uh, cauliflower and broccoli, I guess. Yeah, it must be. Yeah. I know that, uh, I think Taylor used to say that uh, broccoli was nature's broom. Okay. Presumably because it sweeps out all the bad stuff, I guess. Or, right. You know. Yeah. I don't okay. know. Yeah. Something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but I was going to say, like, all, all the jazz guys that I saw, I, also, also, I saw them when they were all, like, knocking on death's door. Like, Elvin Jones, uh, he couldn't walk to stage, and his, his, like, he had circulation issues, so his legs were, you know, that thing that happens when you have circulation issues. Yeah, like but a he sat down at the drums, and it was just like, hmm. what's that? Well, like a thrombosis swelling type thing. Exactly. Mm. But he sat down at the drums and it was just like, it really was like you're watching like a spirit dancing around the room. It was just wow. otherworldly. You know, and that's like, yeah, that's the way you want to die is just doing that. And then eventually you yeah. die. <laughs> so, yeah, hopefully never retire for sure. Yeah, retirement. But, um, but yeah. My manager it, keeps saying nice. to me, okay, he says to me, uh, you know, I can't really picture you doing uh, the cat suits and all jumping around for you know, another 10 years. I'm like, what the fuck what? am I going to do then? <laughs> Wait, no. no, I can, I can imagine you doing it forever. <laughs> yeah. Forever. Yeah. I can okay. imagine you doing it when you're like 82, like for sure. Yeah. I mean, if so, I get to 82, I mean, that'd be a fucking miracle, but it's nice of you to say so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, um, okay. So awesome. I, I know that you've got somewhere to be, Nate, you've been oh, yeah. really gracious, but yeah. I'm going to ask you some quick fire. <laughs> It's been fun. Things. I mean, yeah. I had so many questions to ask you. We didn't get around to any of them. It's hilarious. Oh, man. Okay, quick fire. Um, do you recognize this piece of uh, Cockney rhyming slang? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that Nate Wood, he looks, he looks mighty dashing uh, in a pair of Lionels. Lionels, fuck. No. Lionels is, is rhymes with whatever the thing is. No, because it's the problem with ry rhyming slang is that the second part of it, <laughs> like rhyming slang is like this: Lionel Blair, the famous television personality and oh, dancer. Oh, Tony Blair, like Tony Blair, no. but a li yeah, Lionel Blair. So it would be flares. So they'd be called okay. Lionels. So I'm saying that you look oh, good in a wow. pair of Lionels. That's too complicated. I know. So you, I'm like, sorry. Yeah. No, no, but but here's the thing about here's the thing about America that you don't know is that everybody's an alcoholic, but nobody really drinks enough to learn Cockney rhyming slang. Okay. Like, that's how you know that, like, Americans actually don't drink as much as, like, people yeah. from the UK do because if you really have, like, have enough time on your hands to learn Cockney rhyming slang, you've mm. been in a lot of bars. But actually, you know, <laughs> then you've got things like conditional memory, so you might only recognize the Lionels after you've right. had uh, a few uh, Nelsons, uh, like, a, right. after five Nelsons. What's that? Uh, I don't know. Nelson it's Mandela. Gotta be a pint. Stella. Oh, Stella. Oh, <laughs> God. I'm in. A, I'm in a band with uh, Will Vinson, who is. Uh, he's British, and he's moving back to London. And I think he told me that one. Ah. Uh, forgot it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was trying to teach us fucking around this line. Yeah. I'll, I'll. I'll have some more. Next time we do it, we're gonna have to do this again because like we've got. We haven't even got halfway through the research that I had for you. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's do these ones. Last. Last song you listened to today. Oh, uh, it would have been a Richard Steckel song. Um, nobody, you don't know who he is, but he is, he was in my parents' band Honk from the early 70s. I put him on a level of writing of John Lennon, I would say. He's like that good of a songwriter. Wow. But um, he's cool. also like, he, he never, he wasn't good at putting his music out, but mm -hmm. he's kind of, for me, it's like his music was a, I heard his music when I was 16. I was like, I have to do that because it was like such a weird combination of things that I wanted to hear and it gave me the, the freedom to do that. Mm -hmm. I also feel like if his music had been successful, people 
he was successful. But if people had heard all of his music, I actually think it would be music now would be different than it is because it was that uh, ahead of its time in a way. Wow. Anyway, so I heard one of his things. Okay, cool. That was it. That's a, that's a great one. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks Who's the, the best answer. drummer right now? Best living drummer? Best living drummer, Jack DeJohnette. Best Who's guitarist? That? Okay, uh, best guitarist, Kurt Rosenwinkel. Best bassist? Uh, Tim Lefebvre. Best vocalist? Ooh, Michael Mayo. <laughs> you already mentioned him earlier, that's great. Yeah. Consistency, I love that. Um, so yeah. what sh which free album should everyone have in their collection? And you are allowed to say your own. Oh my God, my own, are you kidding me? Yeah, no, um, I'm not kidding you. Yeah, I would you, you never need to say stop. that. You need to stop promoting yourself, come on. <laughs> this is your platform <laughs> dude three oh my god three albums okay what's your three albums fuck don't ask me I don't know um, wait so nobody's ever asked so no. here's the thing about you and and also people like so nobody's ever worn a cat suit on stage with you which is mind blowing <laughs> yeah. because like who wouldn't want to do that right away uh, yeah. and to then, be honest that, that's one of the, <laughs> I mean we've we've talked about this before but this is one of the things that I think I don't know. It's it's that's part. It's part of your attitude. Like you, you're a team player. You want to wear the costume, and I, no one's ever done that. I've I've and I've been in sort of like um, situations where I've been around musicians where, you know, they might even be on my on the payroll. I might be paying them to to play with me. I still don't want to wear the fucking costumes, and you are like, let me have one of that. <laughs> I would join a band just to wear the costumes because it's just, it's hilarious and awesome. It's like it has everything. And also, it's just like your Hasselhoff poster where it makes you want to be a better version of yourself because, yeah. you know, you just have that accompaniment with you. you Since know? that day when I introduced 20,000 people to your nipples, have you looked yeah. down upon them and have, you, and have you regarded them in the mirror in any different light? Do you think it helped um, long term? Not really. No, not really. I mean... Yeah, probably not. But um, anyway, that was still great. You still need to, maybe it's because you need to have a garment like that which showcases them. I think so. Man, I've, I've noticed that Steel Beans is like, he's killing it with those with those costumes. Yeah. Have you seen the one where he's like, I saw a video recently where he was, first of all, he sounds unbelievable. Like, like he sounded really good when the video sounded great, but now I saw some clips of him live and it's like, I know this from doing what I do too, mm. which is that it becomes crazy tight, like almost like a mm. like a vaudevillian type thing. Okay. But he's like leaning into the vaudeville yeah. with both the music and the, the dress. He was wearing something that looked Haw Hawkins-esque, <laughs> like a cat suit of yours. Really? <laughs> but he it was full silver, and then he'd painted his entire face and his hair full silver. Wow. Uh, it was just gorgeous. It was really a thing. I hope yeah. he left a patch of skin to breathe because when they did that in in the film uh, Goldfinger, I think the the lady that they painted ended up dying because there's no. Holy. Yeah. Wow. Not the well, actress. I, only I saw, mean, I'm in the I, movie. That was. A, <laughs> okay. Yeah. In the in the clip, uh, it looked like no inch was spared. It wow. looked like it was full. That's a ballsy. Yeah. That's a ballsy yeah. effort. Looked great. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's the main thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, so three records. Your okay. three records. Three al okay, three albums everyone should have in their collection. Okay. Um, oh, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to say... I don't even know which Queen one to say. But I'd probably say, like, jazz. Queen jazz. Okay. Um, I would say Cardiacs, A Little Man in the House and the Whole World Window. Nice. And then I would say Power Rage, ACDC. Okay. Because I'm a rocker. Great. You know. Yeah. Holy crap. Man, I can't do it. Okay, I'm just going to go, like, for well, me, if I have... I don't necessarily stand by the no. ones I said, but you've got... No, no, this, but you this, just say three. This is like so the if slowest I had to pick... quick fire round I've ever done. <laughs> no, I know. If I had to pick three artists, it would be Beatles, it would be yeah. Miles Davis, uh, Quintet, mm -hmm. uh, second grade Quintet in the, in the 60s, mm -hmm. and Aphex Twin. Those would be my three. Ah, cool. If I could only pick, like, three. Yeah. So I'll just say, like, Revolver. 
Yeah. And uh, Come to Daddy, which is Aphex Twin EP. Yeah. And then I'll say uh, Miles Davis Quintet e, uh, ESP. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Shit, now I feel bad about my ones. <laughs> what? No, yours are great. Also because those, like, those make up who you are. It's like, oh, yeah, darkness. Like, yeah. When I said everyone, plus, I meant me. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> No, but it's like it's it's you, but that's yeah, that's the influence. But my music sounds like that stuff too. Sounds yeah. like Beatles meets Apex Twin kind of. So when we do stuff together, is it going to sound like Queen, ACDC, Cardiacs, Beatles, Apex Twin, and Miles Davis? Yep, Fuck. definitely. I'm in. Yeah, it's gonna and there's only going to be two of us on stage. It's going to be awesome. You have to teach me the yeah. accordion though, because I think that's the only instrument we can't cover between us. <laughs> oh, yeah, we should totally do accordion. Yeah, man. Just yeah. for that sort of French vibe, you know, be great. Yep, totally. Um, what's great. our project called? I don't know, man. I leave that to you. Um, Fuck. Um, shit, we'll come back to that. Maybe and is it a some... duo? Because also, I was thinking. No, because like, I don't want you to. T- I don't want you to focus too much on having to do all that stuff and. The, you know what though? Okay, here's a question that I'm answering that you didn't ask. I like doing that. Like, <laughs> for me, when I play, when I just play drums now, it doesn't stimulate as many parts of my brain as playing mm. multiple instruments. Mm. When I play drums and bass, it's like, oh, harmony, yeah, cool. Mm. Drums and bass, guitar, it's like, oh, you know, like, it's. I prefer playing more instruments at the same time. Okay, so what's the what's the lineup then? It's me and you. Yeah, I can play <laughs> bass and drums at the same time. Hey? No, but it could just be that because I see now what I'm doing is I'm playing guitar, but I'm playing mm. a, I have a sub octaver on the low string, so it's playing mm. bass and mm. guitar at the same time. And it, and it only isolates one string that does that. I have it set to cross over at 85 hertz, so it yeah. only does it only reads up to like F sharp on the A string. Yeah, okay. So it's reading that. And when yeah, I go yeah. like, blah, 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 then it goes to bass, like when I get ah, down there. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I could just do that. So you weren't tempted to get like, like an eight-string guitar or something and have a couple of... Uh, I am. Lows. I'm trying to get a seven-string from Ibanez. Mm. I'm trying to get one. So uh, to the makers of the Ibanez guitars, uh, <laughs> you need to do the Nate Wood uh, NW3000 series with... Uh, how many strings do you need on there? Eight or seven? I think seven. I mean... Yeah, Give him eight. Have an eight, 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 eight cool. in there as well. Maybe eight's You're cool. have to play it, dude. Low F sharp was what that would be. That'd be yeah, pretty sick. With, with a low F sharp. Um, so mm-hmm. uh, if you want to try and put something like that together, uh, <laughs> hit me up and I'll, I'll forward uh, Nate's details. <laughs> nice. Um, Wait, who else is going to be in our band? I don't know. Uh, okay. I mean, I think it would be nice to get somebody to cover some of the guitar parts, quite honestly, because then I can They're run gonna around. They're going to be ridiculous. I, don't, I mean, I could run around with like a cat suit on and just shout a bit and you know, point at people, do, the, do my usual stuff. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know. Or yeah. not, I don't know. Let's work on some music first and then we'll see okay. where it <laughs> see what it needs. <laughs> you know what? I'm kind of thinking, okay, this is important, but I'm kind of thinking if we're going to make music, we should probably be in the same room. You know? Like yeah. we should get, I'm, well, this you're is coming probably in, not you're podcast coming over, material. You're, you're, you're coming yeah, over. I'm not now. What? I'm not. I'm sorry. So I, I was going to do, I was going to, play in Shanghai at a jazz festival with four <laughs> and then I was going to go straight to Switzerland and be there a day ahead of time so we can hang out but now I'm going on tour with Snarky Puppy and I'm doing that because I can do 10 gigs of four instead of two yeah okay so Makes my sense. thing my thing with four is like the more I play the better it gets the more people see it the more I have a chance of doing absolutely. it absolutely no I so. mean I totally get that but we should like get together sometime and just yeah. F around exactly. that's the way to do it it is because that would be hilariously fun, like regardless of yeah. what happens, you know? Yeah. But I don't know. Uh, anyway, anyway, we'll just press. <laughs> we'll, let, like, let's finish up the uh, thing. Favorite okay. new yeah. or up and coming artist? Well, favorite new artist, um, it has to be, yeah, Lewis, Cole, and Genevieve mm. Artati. Yeah. Um, Pedro Martins, Federico Heliodoro. Mm. Um, I really like. Um, I like Adrian Lenker and the uh, the um, that band Beak Thief. I like them a lot too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else. Um, that's all I got right now. Okay. 
Brilliant. How about you? Um, I mean, if you're including Lewis Cole in in new and up and coming, I don't know because new and up and coming doesn't really apply to Lewis Cole, does it? Yeah. I mean, been around for ages, always been brilliant. It seems to grow. Stuff goes viral. But I don't know if his household name kind of fodder, if you know what I mean. Like, he's more than that. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe you're up and coming until you're playing arenas or something. Oh, maybe. well then. <laughs> of course, I mean, you and I are Wembley boys, so. It's, right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're way we're way past up and I coming. mean we're we're looking down from the from, from Mount Wembley. Um, yep. yeah. So <laughs> I don't know. I mean there's loads of cool like, I like there's a lot of little punk bands and stuff that I like as well. Yeah. Um but and again they've been around for a little while. There's one called Bad Nerves that I really like. They're coming on tour of us in, in the UK. Oh cool. Um nice. and I saw them play and they just did some stuff that was it was just, I don't know, there's something about watching them live that I just really appreciate because it's it's got all the energy and the snottiness and all that stuff, but there's some set pieces that don't look choreographed in a way that stops it from being punk, but really have a resounding effect. And even if you don't remember the song necessarily, because, you know, it's a sweaty night, you're hearing stuff for the first time, you remember these moments that they do, and I just think that's... Mm. When a band's on the same page like that, I just I always enjoy watching that. So Bad Nerves mm. is one of mine. Are they doing uh, America with you too? No, I don't think so. I'm not sure okay. who's going to be the opener. Mm. Um, maybe I'll talk to you about that. <laughs> just, nice. Um, Ready. If you, if you had to play... No, sorry, I'll do this one. An artist or a band that you think should be more well-known? Lewis Cole. <laughs> no, I do though. Yeah. He yeah. should. I mean, he? he's yeah. well known, but he should be more well known. Yeah. I also think Paris Monster should be more more well known. I'm definitely going to uh, check those guys out. Yeah. Or that guy. Is it one? I one thought guy, Paris. It? I thought it's two guys. Two I thought guys. they were going to take over the world. I really did. Yeah. And I mean, they still might, but I think they should be more, more well known. Okay, that's brilliant. Um, yep. If you had to play one song on repeat for 24 hours, which one would you choose? Oof, man. It would either be Richard Steckel ending, or it would be like. I don't know. And your bird can sing by the Beatles. One of those. Cool. Yeah. How about you? <laughs> Stop asking me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? The thing that I really love, like, the thing that I've been listening to a lot lately, and I can imagine myself having in my, you know, Desert Island collection, really, would be. I've been listening to like just because it doesn't matter. Like I've had a really stressful couple of weeks, a shoulder mm. injury, my That's hemorrhoids, true. all this stuff. You know, I could overshare, but <laughs> the one thing that that always lifts me and makes me feel impressed is "I'm Tight" that from the new Lewis Cole record. Oh yeah, and it's long as well. And I have these <laughs> journeys with my daughter. And it's like, most of the time we're driving for 20, 25 minutes and she's going, oh, we can take it in turns and do songs. And I'm like, okay. And I choose songs that are like seven or eight minutes long and it really pisses her off. And that, and always, <laughs> that's, that's the one I go to, you know, because then she has to listen to Lewis Cole for seven and a half minutes, Man. which I think is an education for a child, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. I love that song because it's kind of, it's so weird. Like, mm. it's so like long in the sentiment could be like a second it could be two <laughs> seconds long but it just lasts for so long and there's all these like little gemstones hidden throughout like yeah. all these little things that are and it really reminds me of prince mm. but lewis doesn't like prince <laughs> which I, is kind of interesting I, to me i mean I, I think it has like something of the there's something in that song that's just got like I know what you mean because somebody else I played it to said Prince. Oh, but they really like Prince and I was like I don't think they do actually. Lewis doesn't like Prince. Yeah, cuz it's sort of like it's not it's not like a pop progression, like a the Prince stuff. Like if you heard a song like that, the nearest you know, it's, controversy is a long song that has a lot of this that's, kind of movement. And that's stuff why in. I'm thinking is because Prince writes so many songs like that, where it's like that could be done in two minutes, but then it take it goes yeah. on for like yeah, eight but that's minutes, not like, like our that Father is, art in heaven. There's yeah. there's so much stuff in in I'm tight that's like it's so fucking good. All the singing's great. The bass playing's phenomenal. 
Yeah. And there's some just brilliant stuff in the arrangement that bears repeat listening. So I'd say that one would keep me, I'd be able to chew on that for a good period of time before I go completely insane. Mm-hmm. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's hard. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to find music like that. Mm. But yeah. yeah it must be cool. even yeah. harder have you had to make Lewis it. On this, have you had Lewis on no, the show? No, no, I've never met him. No. Okay. My well, daughter's dying to meet him. Do it. You guys should <laughs> clearly do this. Yeah. He's the nicest guy ever. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, we obviously both love Lewis Colt. I love you. Mm-hmm. I think you're fucking fantastic. <laughs> I, love you too. I mean, it's just been brilliant. I won't take up any more of your time, Nate. I'm going to no, sing man. the theme. Yeah, too. I could talk all day. Super, super fun. Evidently. Let's do another one of these because you're <laughs> fucking great. Exactly. Man, get me going. And then, I I, then I'll ask the second question on my sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Hawkins rides again. Hit me, Nate. Again. (laughs) (laughs) Lovely stuff. Great. Uh, Honestly, that was fucking awesome. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Nate. I think we'll do another one with Nate because I've we spoke for nearly two hours but I didn't ask him half of the questions that I wanted to he's brilliant make sure to check out his music on YouTube and also follow him on Instagram because he posts really cool videos on there too um, I'll see you next Monday for another long form episode where I'll be discussing failure my favourite theme cheers okay.